So let's look at memory briefly. Um, this is, the, the DC stuff was weird to you. This is going to be even stranger. Um, memory has been looked for in the brain as to where it's been stored forever. They, they looked for the engram. Where, where's the brain storing memory? Uh, do you have a neuron somewhere buried in your brain? That's your grandmother neuron and a gray neuron. And when they synapse, you get a gray-haired grandmother. Uh, no, that's not how the brain works. It, 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 we would be limited in how many things we could hold in the brain rather badly if we had to ha assign a neuron for specific functions. And as such, um, they found that memories aren't stored anywhere. They're stored everywhere in the brain. And in fact, Carl Prebrem's work shows that memory is really a hologram. Now, a hologram, if you've seen one, is maybe on a, a plate. It has an edge to the plate that it's printed on or in. And you can turn it and you can see the entire image. If you drop that plate and break it into three pieces and you pick up a piece and you look at it, what do you see? A third of the image? No. The entire image is there with a third of the resolution. So uh, the entire image is contained in each piece of the image in a hologram. It's a distributed Gabor function. And literally a Gabor function is a wavelet. And uh, you can end up um, identifying these in the brain. In animal research, you stick electrodes into the brain of a rat and you stimulate their whiskers with a bunch of different textures and so forth. You can literally map in the brain a Gabor function. And a Gabor function is how a hologram is encoded. So we know that essentially that holograms are how the brain stores memories. A hologram doesn't have an edge, does it? A hologram is an interference pattern. Not the plate that it's on, but the hologram itself is an interference pattern without an edge, which means that my memory doesn't stop here inside of my head. Uh, it's a distributed function without an edge. We can share memories, archetypal memories, by two people tapping into the same basic hologram. So th this is a, a uh, uh, and there's a lot of spooky stuff that goes with all of this. I mean, it gets weirder and weirder and weirder as you start to delve into the holographic model. For us to share a memory, we have to have a superconductor in the brain to receive the uh, a hologram. I mean, it, it gets really weird. Uh, however, uh, it's hard science. It's weird hard science, but it's very hard science. Um, Carl Prebrem deserves the Nobel Prize for bringing to neurophysiology quantum physics. Um, and and uh, uh, he'll never get it because the politics is all wrong. You know, that, but uh, um, semantic memory is essentially the alpha tuning. If your alpha is a little bit faster, your semantic or declarative memory is much, much better. But that's your semantic or declarative memory. You also have episodic memory, your short-term working memory, which is frontal. It's not your alpha tuning. It's the frontal um, uh, limbic uh, um, activity. So semantic memory is thalamocortical. Episodic memory is limbic. It's seen as frontal midline theta, which is a specific form of theta. It's not just theta that happens to be seen at the frontal midline. This is brief bursts of phasic theta, a brief burst less than one second long. It's healthy brain function associated with episodic recall. So uh, a healthy brain has a burst of theta. It doesn't con uh, continue. It's a brief burst frontally with a memory task. Essentially, for memory to really work, you have to have an interaction between your long-term memory and your short-term memory, or nothing would make it into your long-term memory. You have to hold something in your short-term memory to transfer it to long-term memory. So for memory to work, we have to have an interaction between the limbic theta and the thalamocortical alpha. So this relationship ends up being 
the event-related potential. If you instantaneously synchronize alpha and theta and summate their wave shapes and play them, you get the wave form of an event-related potential. An evoked potential is the relay of the sensory signal to the brain. But an event-related potential is the brain's oscillatory response to that stimulus. So up to 100 milliseconds is simply the arrival of the information at the cortex. But from that point forward, we're really looking at event-related potentials uh, as being the generator of the wave shape. So if we phase lock alpha and theta and let them run, suddenly you get the wave shape of the event-related potential. This time series is what happens when you end up interacting between short-term and long-term memory. Uh, this is the mechanism for transfer of information between short-term and long-term memory. And this locking together in phase instantaneously is the trick. Now you have to have a phase reset. Okay, something has to tell the the wave shape that's ongoing stop, and now start right now. I want you to start. Well, what could that thing that turns the brain on and off be? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe direct current potentials. In fact, that's basically what we end up seeing is that the DC field potentials can create an instantaneous phase lock that creates binding. The DC field potentials operate at the speed of light. They're not propagated along neural pathways. They're a field effect. And as such, uh, when binding happens, it instantaneously binds divergent points in the brain. It's not that there's a circuit that starts here and it goes to there and there and there and there and when it gets back these are now locked together. This is an instantaneous distant locking together using field potentials.